I won't bring that up again. All right. <clears throat> <clears throat> the first time I stood on this platform to, um, oh, by the way, I want to warn you about something. In the back of our auditorium over the sound room, about this big around, we have a huge clock that hangs on the wall that I ignore every Sunday. You guys are in trouble. I don't see anything to kind of even halfway keep me in check this morning. <clears throat> so my, uh, I told the preacher. I told the preacher last night when I was talking to him. I said, uh, by the time, and most folks here may not even know me, but by the time I finish my four-hour sermon, they will. <clears throat> but actually, my daughter Kim has uh, volunteered to go like this whenever she's about done. So. First time I stood at this on this platform, uh, in this in this church, was uh, Easter Sunday night, uh, nineteen eighty one. I had uh, was in Bible school in Pensacola, Florida, and uh, the guy who ran the Bible school had come back from a meeting here at this church. Never heard of this church before, and he said that he had uh, talked to the pastor, and the pastor wanted to start a Bible institute and was looking for anybody to be interested. I didn't move, but the guy sitting next to me did. He poked me in the, in the ribs. He said, you ought to go talk to him about that. I said, I can't do that. He said, you need to go talk to him about that. So after church, I did. I went up and I got Brother Lawson's name and number, and I called him. And my father-in-law and I made a trip up here uh, so I could meet him and I basically apply for the job and uh, the rest as they say around here is history. Uh, how many here uh, that are here today was here uh, when when I was here between 81 and 84? You're not going to get off that easy. Stand up. <laughs> and now that you're standing we'll take another offering. <clears throat> no, I do appreciate that very much. I appreciate that. Uh, Last, uh, last October, uh, last August, actually, we, we celebrated the anniversary, but last October we had a homecoming uh, celebration, pastor appreciation celebration, and uh, last August marked uh, my 20th year being pastor of Bible Way Baptist Church. Um, a lot of my, uh, how shall I say this, my preparatory years in preparing me to be a pastor of a church and minister in a church was done right here in, in those three years that I served here uh, in, in this church. For those of you that don't know me, I'll try to make it brief. If I, if I at all know what that word means, I'll try to make it brief and kind of give you a heads up. I am from Florida, about 20 miles east of Pensacola. We just about washed away the other day, those of you that've been watching the news. Um, but I am not an outsider flatlander. So you'll feel more comfortable. I was born in La Follette in Campbell County. So I'm from around here. And uh, I also uh, want to make a request, since I do have a little bit of clout, could I have security sent by those guys right there? <clears throat> I know some history on those guys. But uh, we, uh, we spent three years here. Uh, we came up in 1981 and left in June of 1984. And as the preacher mentioned, uh, worked in the Christian Day School, worked at the, in the Bible Institute at night, led the choir, special music, uh, youth for a while. And uh, I brought a lot of things with me today that I didn't have then. Mainly, I'm about twice the size I was when I was here. And I didn't used to have to have these things, but uh, I was glad to see the preacher was wearing them, so I wasn't too far out of, uh, out of whack. Uh, but this church has meant a lot to me and my family, the, the folks that are here. Uh, I was sitting down there just a few minutes ago between my wife and Kim Smith, and uh, I perfectly understood that fro phrase, a rose between two thorns. And um, But seriously, any of you any of you know Kim Smith know exactly what I mean. 
<clears throat> but we've had, we've had a lot of friends here through the years and kept in uh, pretty good contact. Try to come through every time we're traveling through this area, and uh, I very much appreciate uh, the ministry that the church uh, has done here to my family. In the three years we were here, we rented a house from Bob and Lois Weiser right down the street here at 2524 West Woodrow and uh, rented a half a duplex there. We lived there for the three years we were here. This church has been a lot in the history of my family. Uh, for those of you that are unaware, this church helped us through probably one of the darkest times that uh, our family has ever experienced. We, um, uh, we have a son buried in Greenwood Cemetery or Green Lawn, Green Lawn, I guess it is. Anyway, over on Tazzle Pike. Uh, stillborn son, uh, was born in 1982, and this church was uh, was a great help to us as we uh, as we faced that very difficult time in our lives. And I I cannot thank you enough for all you meant to our family and have meant to our family through all the years. I was uh, I'm always amazed how the Lord. I shouldn't be, but I'm always amazed about how the Lord brings things together. <clears throat> Preacher had no idea what I was going to preach on. I had no idea what he was going to teach on. Uh, he mentioned this morning about, uh, in, in passing, I think nestled in there somewhere uh, in all that history <clears throat> was a phrase he used about uh, the church not bringing in the kingdom and what the role of the church is. He had no idea what I was going to be preaching on this morning. But this morning I'm going to talk to you and remind you, this is no, no new information, but I want to remind you about the calling of the church, what we're here for. Uh, it's yeah. not, and I agree with him, it's not to bring in the kingdom, uh, but we do have a role that we are supposed to be fulfilling here on this earth. And that's what I want to talk to you about for just a little bit this morning. If you want to take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 20, by the way, I want to show you this. I have tried my best to indoctrinate folks in Florida. <clears throat> my blood runs orange. I can't help it. I come by it natural. Now I'm in the land of gators and crimson tide and I'm not sure if they want to be tigers or war eagles. It depends on which Saturday the Auburn plays. But my blood runs orange. And I've mentioned that a couple of times since I've been there. Several years ago, a couple in my church got me a gift. <clears throat> I have an orange King James Bible. <clears throat> so uh, they, they said in the very front, it says, um, <clears throat> let's see, uh, well, they, I don't want to read. Well, I'll go ahead and read what they wrote. When your favorite orange team loses, <laughs> read this if you can't lose. It said your favorite book in your favorite color. I just thought that was good. I appreciated that. So I brought my orange Bible with me this morning. Acts chapter 20, if you will. We're going to read uh, one verse in Acts chapter 20. And if you want to go ahead and uh, skip across to 1 Corinthians 1, we're going to get a couple verses there too. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Amen. The church is important to God. Right. It was important enough for him to give his blood for. Right. I have uh, often preached, we'll get to 1 Corinthians in just a second, so stay standing. <clears throat> I've often said this about uh, the apostle Peter as he warmed his hands by the fires of the enemy. He was willing to die for Jesus Christ but he wasn't willing to live for him. And I, I find uh, that that's true a lot of times. You hear a lot of people say, well, I'd die for God. I'd die for Christ. I don't think he's calling us so much to die for him as he is to live for him. That's the influence the church is to have. Something important enough for God to die for, we ought to be at least willing to live for. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, just going to read a couple of verses in the very beginning. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes our brother under the church of God which is at Corinth to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord both theirs 
in ours. Lord, this morning I ask that you would just be with us as we expound a few scriptures this morning and remind the church about what she already knows. But you said many times in your scripture to many people about bringing to remembrance lest we forget. We are certainly a forgetful people. Sometimes as they sang earlier, we just forget to be thankful. But we forget just how good you are to us on a daily basis. We forget how you supply all of our needs according to uh, your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We forget just how much you love us. But God, this morning, I trust that you would help us by way of just a few thoughts to remind us about what the church is here for. We're obviously, as the preacher said this morning, we're not destined to bring in the kingdom. We're not ushering in a millennium of peace. That's your job. But you left us with a job. And God, I trust that you would help us reignite a fire inside of us this morning that the Holy Spirit of God would take each and every Christian here and remind us of our task, remind us of our duties, remind us of our calling. And we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for his sake. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. There's a lot of things that your church is to be, and there's a lot of things that the church has become historically that though they're not in, entirely of, in and of themselves bad things, they're just things that I believe have taken us away from the true calling of the church. Having been a pastor for 20 years, we get phone calls all the time. Uh, mostly from people that uh, are down on their luck, whatever the case may be. They'll call, and of course, that's the downside of having a church name that starts with B. In the phone book, we're toward the top. I've often wanted to change it to Zion or Zenith or anything besides Bible Way. Because they flip through there, they're going to call, and uh, folks will call. And listen, I, I don't mind helping folks that have, have trouble. I've been in trouble. I've been in situations where folks have come along and given me a green handshake, and I sure did appreciate it. But uh, a lot of people, especially the world, kind of has this view and a vision about what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be a bank that charges no interest. We're supposed to be a, a truly benevolent organization, so every little scratch and every little bump they have, they can call the church, and we're obligated to help them. Give you a little quick story. Had uh, in our old church building, we're now in a in a church building uh, up up in uh, the upper part of uh, Milton, north part of Milton. But when we first took the church, we were down a little triple wide mobile home type building uh, down south of town, and uh, we we're in their services one night, and somebody came in. And they came in, sat in the back of the of the auditorium after the church service. They came up and. Of course, they want to know who the preacher is. I figure they're not from the sword of the Lord and just interviewing, so uh, I figured they were there for some help. So they came up there and they said, "We're, you know, it, you can. I, I don't want to sound callous, but you can almost cookie cutter names, places, and dates and, and stuff. After a while, you you figure out that not everybody's as honest as we are." And so they started the, uh, the spiel about being out of gas and on their way to their sick mother slash grandmother slash aunt slash tw uncle twice removed. And, and they started the, the story. Of course, I was a little greener back then. I believed everything I was told. And so they have this big long spiel of just trying to do something. I had learned enough, though, to know don't give them cash. So I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I said, I'll follow you up here to the gas station. I'll put gas in your car. And if you're hungry, I'll take you right up here in the middle of town. There's Burger King. I'll take you up there and I'll buy whatever you want. I didn't, I didn't make them eat kids' meals. I'll buy what, whatever you want. You just tell me what you want. You, you just walk up there to the counter. You order whatever you want. And I'll pick up the tab. Oh, we really appreciate that. So they did that, and I left them there. Uh, they got their food, they went to the table, and I shook hands with them, went on down the road. 
The next day I was teaching at a Christian school up there, and the next day one of the girls in high school came up to me who was working at Burger King that night. She said, uh, Brother Wright, you know what happened after you left? I said, what's that? She said, they brought that food back up to the counter and wanted to cash it in. Now see, that's the kind of people that make you want to not help anybody. That's the kind of people that when, when somebody comes up to me and said, I need to talk to the preacher, I need help. That's the kind of people that make me want to say, hit the road, Jack. Hit the Benevolent Association. Go down there to this group or that group. Go down to Red Cross, whatever. We're not in the given business. But we are in the given business. We are in the helping business. We are in the benevolence business. He said, as you therefore have opportunity, he said, do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. But he did say, do it to everybody. You know, we know that at the Lord, we, we know all the stuff. We know that God will bless you for giving and what they do with it afterwards is not your, we, we know all that. But I'm here to tell you that our main job is not to be the world's bank. It's not to be the benevolent society uh, for everybody. That's not our main task. We should help people when we can. I don't have a problem with that. But that's not our main calling. And though there's a lot I could talk about this morning, and mostly in my church I do talk a lot about everything, but I'm going to try to keep it down today. I'm going to give you three things. It doesn't encompass everything, but I'm going to give you three important things that will help us remember what our calling is as a church. Number one, I believe our calling encompasses the evangelization of sinners. Now, <clears throat> this is one place where you don't have to define a lot of terms. I mean, this is one place where I know Preacher Lawson. I know he knows a lot of stuff. And I know when he delivers a message, I've sat under him for years. Uh, I've listened to him coming back, and, and that's, I know that he's going to pour out a bunch of information in the time he has you before him. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time educating you on terms. But I will help you to remember this. All have sinned to come short of the glory of God, right? Amen. So if there's anybody in here exempt from that, I don't know who you are. We're all sinners. I, I get that. From a biblical definition, we're all sinners. All have sinned, so therefore we're all sinners. I'm going to tell you, from a ministerial standpoint, the biggest trouble I think we have in dealing with lost sinners is getting them to understand the concept of them being sinners. By that I mean this. Most people have got it down to where they say, well, I don't cheat. I don't steal. I don't commit adultery. I don't murder. I don't do this, this, and this, which are qualifiably sins. So therefore, I'm not a sinner. I try to get our folks to understand all the time, to remind them all the time. We are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. If we can ever get folks to grasp that simple concept, the bottom line is it's not the things that we can quantify that we do or shouldn't do that is the problem. We are the problem. Sinner is the problem. And we know that if we can get folks to understand their sinful condition, and we can understand that all of us started out just like that. We were born in that condition. Uh, that we all are sinners. If we can get folks to understand that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Amen. That's why he came. He loved Amen. sinners. Right. Right. <clears throat> sinners. Evangelizing the sinners. That's preaching the gospel. There is nothing else that will help a sinner. We might feed them for a moment. We might clothe them for a month or a week or a year. But that's not what they really need. That's not the permanent help they need. The permanent help they need is the blood of Jesus Christ to wash their sin away. That's what they need. 
We need to preach the gospel, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every year since I've been there, we just had our 21st sunrise service. Sunrise is beautiful on the Gulf Coast. We go down to Carpenter's Park in the city of Milton. They have a huge gazebo there. Usually have about 100 folks out. We go at 6 o'clock in the morning. Again, I've learned a few lessons. When we first started doing it, I would watch and see when sunrise was going to be. If it was going to be at 548, we'd make sure everything was timed out for 548. If it was going to be 612, I would, and I finally I figured it out, it's okay, this ain't working. We're going to say 6 o'clock in the morning. If the sun comes up before we're ready, so be it. If it's a few minutes late, so be it. Found out that it really doesn't matter anyway because I can't control the weather. Actually, believe it or not, Northwest Florida, we, it has been 75 degrees Easter Sunday morning at the sunrise service with a thousand percent humidity. <laughs> I mean, it has been sweltering out there. I mean, literally just pouring the sweat off of you. And reminiscent of my early youth in Ohio and my days here, it has been like 27 and sleeting. So we get a little bit of everything down there. Uh, we, we just prepare for six. I love sunrise service. I don't necessarily like getting up that early like anybody else, but I love being out there and they're just, well, this year was just perfect weather. Clear as a bell. We always orient ourselves. We go down there, there's a little park there with a, with a draw that goes down into Blackwater River. Just a beautiful setting. We always aim toward the east. Everybody sits looking toward the east. Boy, that sun comes up there, peaks over those. I mean, it is just gorgeous. I love Easter. I love Easter services. But Easter services don't just happen on whatever day they pick Easter to be in the, in the year for me. Every day is resurrection day for me. Every day is a reminder that Jesus Christ came up from the dead. I'm glad to know that we can't just, it's like Christmas. I, I, I love Christmas time. But I don't just talk about the birth of Christ on the 25th of December. I don't just talk about uh, Jesus coming out of the ground just on the day that everybody has deemed appropriate for that. I'm glad I can tell you every day of the week, Jesus Christ was God manifested the flesh. He was born of a virgin in Bethlehem and he was raised, he lived a sinless life. And about the age of 30, he started this public ministry and for three and a half years, he ran around in his public ministry. And then they cruelly crucified him there on the hill of Golgotha's brow in Jerusalem. And he died for the sins of the whole world. They buried him in a borrowed tomb. And I wish there was more to tell. I love the birth. I love the life. I love the ministry. I love the death and the burial for my sins. But oh, that third and glorious morning. When he came out that other side, it's still shouting ground over 2,000 years later that Jesus Christ conquered death, hell, and the grave. That's the story we have for lost sinners. The evangelization of sinners. He that winneth souls is still wise. Somebody who, who gets it on their heart to, to understand that everybody they run into is a potential lost sinner that will die and go to hell without Jesus Christ. He came not to call the righteous, but sinners Amen. to repentance. Amen. How many of you in here this morning are saved? You weren't born in that condition. Somebody told you about it. And somebody told you the gospel and you said, I'll take that free gift. I'll take that salvation that's freely offered to me. And somebody cared enough about you to tell you. Do you care enough about anybody else to tell them? I'm going to tell you what I told my church. Everybody's been on shouting ground up to now. Let me pull it in just a little bit closer to home. I believe the one reason the lost sinful world doesn't trust us to deliver the gospel it's not because the gospel isn't true. And not because it's not even believable in the sense of 
everybody I think kind of has that little thing surely there's something there's a way out it's because I don't believe we wrap it up in a very believable package see I think the ultimate problem with evangelizing sinners is not the sinner it's certainly not the gospel I think the problem is us if you're going to deliver the gospel make sure it's believable wrap it up in a package that they'll accept you say well what do you mean by that I thought you'd never ask you know when you're at work and <clears throat> it doesn't quite go the way you think it ought to go that day your boss is being kind of just the way bosses are he's not being fair he treats another employee better than he does you and it just seems like the ones that do wrong all the time are the ones that get the advantage and here you are trying to keep your nose clean and just seems like you're stepped on the whole way gives raises to everybody else but you everything in, in, in the world is just crashing down on you somebody comes up to you and asks you a simple question and you take them off at the knees boy you I mean you let off with a tirade you, you, you say words that you swore to God you'd never use again boy it's quiet in here the next day you come in bearing gospel tracts and you want to hand him one. Listen, sinners need somebody to care enough to tell them about a Savior. But they also need to be, the message needs to be delivered in a believable package. The evangelization of sinners. Secondly, I give you this. The calling of the church is to evangelize sinners. It's also the edification of the saints. I see there's a term there that makes a big difference. All saints are sinners. But sinners aren't saints. Do you understand that? If somebody's a lost sinner, he's not elevated. He's not changed in his position yet. Now, I'm a saint. You don't have to call me saint. And I may not conduct myself very saintly sometimes. But I'm a saint. I'm still a sinner. One of these days this old body is going to be changed like in his vile, uh, my vile body changed like in his glorious body. That won't be a problem anymore. But until then I've still got that nature in there that tries to claw its way to the top all the time. And let me tell you this. I have a position that is different than a lost sinner in this world now. I am a saint of God. I've been born again into the family of God. He's given me a new title. He has called me a saint. The edification of the saints. Obviously edify just means to build up, just to stabilize, just to, uh, to harden the thing, to make it uh, something that will endure and something that will last. I've been a pastor for over 20 years now. There's something I've learned. What I've learned is that what I told Preacher Lawson in 1981, he probably doesn't even remember me saying this, we were sitting up there in the lunchroom. What was the lunchroom back then? We were sitting there, as I recall, eating hot dogs that Linda had fixed us. Because they fixed a lot of hot dogs back then. But anyway, I just, <laughs> more than likely, we were eating hot dogs up there at lunch. And I said something to Brother Lawson that uh, I don't know if he's even remembered I said, but I said this and I meant it then. And I meant it then kind of halfway jokingly. I meant it now because I've had over 20 years of pastoral experience and I know that what I said was true. If it wasn't for people, the ministry would be easy. If you have not been a pastor or been a minister, you understand exactly what I just said. Now, there is not a higher calling than the ministry. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying. It'd be a whole lot easier if we didn't have to deal with us. It'd be a whole lot easier if we didn't have to deal with the fickleness of human nature that still dwells inside church members. It's too hot. It's too cold. <clears throat> they didn't speak to me today. Why did the preacher say that? Why did they sing that song again? 
They just sang that song last week. Don't they know? I, I mean, you know, uh, I don't know who dresses him, but the preacher's tie doesn't match, match his suit. Now, that would be in my church because I'm about half colorblind. Uh, my, some of my uh, outfits are kind of surprising at best. If my wife doesn't catch me before I go out the door, there ain't no telling how it's going to look. But we gripe and bellyache and complain about the, the smallest of things. Amen. Well, I guess I'm going to have to get here early next week because so-and-so has my seat. Yeah. Now, I've never seen it happen, but I have heard about it, about visitors coming into church. They come to church, a visitor walks in here, never been in here before. There's a few empty seats around when they come in and their chances are they're visitors. They don't know anybody. So they're not going to sit right next to anybody if they can help it. So they're going to go where there's a hole. So they go in there and they sit down in this hole. But the owners of that hole have had to step out to the restroom or something. Make sure they lock their car so all the sinners in the area don't break in and steal what they got out there. And they come back in and there's somebody occupying their seat. Well, got a couple suggestions, pastoral, loving, caring suggestions. Get there earlier. Check your car before you come in. <clears throat> if you don't want somebody to take your seat, chances are they won't sit in your lap. So if you don't want them to take your seat, stay in it. Amen. See, we pastors have answers for nearly everything. <clears throat> Sad news is that uh, some of the saints are pretty thin-skinned. As a ministry prerogative, one of the things, one of my callings as a minister of the gospel, and one of our callings as a saint, is to make sure that we're building each other up the way we should. Uh, you remember the Apostle Paul wrote about a Baptist church, had to be about a Baptist church, because he said, meanwhile you bite and devour one another. I am an independent Baptist. I've been independent Baptist all my life. I know us. I know that we shoot our wounded in the back and bite and devour them on the way by and then spread it to everybody else we know just how sorry they were on the way. And I'm telling you, at best, that's wicked. You want everybody to know your dirty laundry? You want everybody to know what you thought this morning before you got here? You want everybody to know just how sinful that old nature is in your hide? I'd say you probably don't. Then quit spreading everybody else's that you know. I'm gonna tell you something about Facebook. I'm gonna get on a soapbox. <clears throat> Folks in my family, Facebook. I understand the concept. I understand that somebody used to be here and they're not here anymore and so they move away. Let's say we, I, let's say I was on Facebook. I wanted to keep up with what's going on at Temple Baptist. I can, I don't even know, y'all have a Facebook account, don't really care. But let's say I got on there, Temple Baptist Church, Fountain City. Got them a Facebook, and I can go on there, and I can see pictures of everybody. Hopefully, you'll delete Kim's, but you'll the pictures of everybody, and and I can kind of keep. Oh, ain't they looking old? I mean, aren't they looking good? I mean, I can't believe. You know, they're still kicking after all these years. I, you know, you just you, you just look at those things and kind of keep me. Up. And I understand that's the concept, but I've had some folks show me some stuff that's been on Facebook. You better be careful. You better be really careful the kind of information you put on there. Because it will come back to bite you in a place you don't want it to bite you. 
you will create some inadvertent problems with that. You better be careful. <clears throat> Families start having disputes. Well, you know so-and-so, when they, I, they name them. Aunt Sally, do you hear what she did with Uncle, to Uncle Joe? What she said about him, she did this, that, and the other, and pretty soon, Aunt Sally and Uncle Joe, and whoever likes whoever parties they are, now are picking sides. Okay, I get that in the family. My family isn't exactly congenial all the time. I get it. But this family ought to be different. As a matter of fact, there's a term used in the New Testament to describe this family. We're supposed to be peculiar. We're not supposed to act with each other like the world acts with each other. We're supposed to actually get along. I'm going to show you something that, that might be a help to you. Uh, I preached a similar message last Sunday at our church. I'm going to show you something that I think hopefully will be a help to you. Turn, turn over there to the Romans. I want you to look at verse. Over to Romans chapter 14, I want to give you a verse. Now, as you can tell looking at me, I am not an outdoorsman. Never have been much of an outdoorsman. Never cared much. My, my father-in-law, bless his heart, I love him to death. But in my opinion, in some cases, he has no sense whatsoever. We first moved to Florida, he got me out fishing. Now, the only extent of fishing I ever had was a kid growing up. I'd go up to <clears throat> uh, Cove Lake or I'd go around some of those places when my dad and I'd visit down here, visit my grandma. And he'd take me down there and uh, he basically described, I never did fish. He, he basically described that I was sunburning worms because I was very impatient. I'd stick that worm down in the water and if it didn't do something, I'd pull it out and see if it was all right. It's still on there. I stick it back in there. If you, and I pull it back. I, I'm, I'm not patient at that stuff. Uh, I know where I can get fish. <laughs> and I know where I can get fish without a whole lot of work. <clears throat> and it's already cleaned. Yeah. It's already gutted. And I mean, I, I, so I just don't understand the concept. I'll just be honest with you. My father-in-law got me down there in Florida when we first moved down there. He wanted me to go fishing with him. So I did, and they fished different down there. He got me in a saltwater pole and got me out there in the Gulf of Mexico. <clears throat> and he got me wading out this far in the water so that I'm having to hold the rod. That's how they fish down there. Man, I thought it was hard work sitting on the bank waiting for somebody to do something else. <laughs> But they get out there, they cast, and they're reeling it all in, this, that, and the other. And I got to thinking, I ain't the only one in this water. <laughs> There's some stuff in this water that wouldn't mind at all if it hurt me. I never could understand that whole concept. Of why that, so one day, I believe it was the last day I ever went fishing with my father-in-law, we got out there, and God's my witness. Got out there to my chest in salt water. Everything in God's creation in that water. And I'm out there just, and I hook something. I figure, okay, well, this is going to be the redeeming day. This is going to be the day, the day that makes it to where I say, hey, I'd like to do this again. So I'm reeling that thing in. My pole is bent. God is my witness. Down almost to the tip back down to the water. I mean, I am struggling. I'm pulling. I said, man, this is, this is something else. And about from here to that door, stingray about that wide, <laughs> breaks the water with a fin. I handed my pole to my brother-in-law. <laughs> and as God is my witness to this day, my father-in-law said I walked on the water back to the shore. <clears throat> I am not an outdoorsman. <clears throat> I know some of y'all hunt and all that kind of stuff. That's fine. I know where to get meat. <clears throat> Again, my father-in-law, bless his heart. Come to think of it, there's a common thread here too. 
maybe he just tried to get rid of me or something. But we first got married up in Ohio. I've never been uh, deer hunting. I know guys that do and I know guys that love it. They've described it to me how you get out there before it even thinks about being light and you get that deer stand. Best of my knowledge, the only ones I've ever seen about that wide. <laughs> now why would I want to shinny up a tree and sit on something smaller than a bicycle seat and wait for something to come by that may or may not come by and I may or may not be able to shoot it. When well, I can drive down to Walmart and get me all the meat I want. I just don't understand it. Anyway, he got me out rabbit hunting. Up in Ohio, got me out there rabbit hunting. He had me my shotgun and, and all that kind of stuff. And if you've ever been rabbit hunting, it's different than deer hunting. I can't tell you what deer hunting's all about because I've never been, never done it. As far as I know, I never will. But I can tell you about a little rabbit hunting. And that's about all I can tell you about is a little rabbit hunting. But we went rabbit hunting. He got me out there in the snow-covered ground. And uh, you got to walk out through there and look for prints where uh, the little bunny rabbit has been running around in there and leaving his little footprint. So you can trace him back through there and hopefully you can scare you one up and uh, take a pot shot at him when he gets up there big enough for you to be able to see against that white background and and get you a big old rat. I've never seen a big old rabbit. That's another thing I don't understand about rabbit hunting. I tried to eat the meat came off what was left of the rabbit we shot. <laughs> I don't understand like that. That meat don't look like that at Walmart. I, I don't understand why, why, but anyway. I did learn something that you had to do though. When you're rabbit hunting, doesn't do you a bit of good to stand in one spot and wait for them to come to you. They're not gonna do it. You gotta go after them. In order to get the prize at the end, you gotta go after it. Now with that in mind, I want you to read Romans chapter 14, verse 19. Let us, he's not talking about the world, not talking about the government, not talking about America, let us. You know who us is? All together, everybody tell who us is. Us. You ready? Us. That's who this is talking about. You ever, you ever wondered why Baptists can't get along? Even Baptists that love each other? Because they're not practicing verse 19 of Romans 14. You can't walk in a room and get along with everybody just because you're in the room with everybody. It's hard work. That's why we don't do it. Let us, therefore, follow after. That's what I had to do with that rabbit. It wasn't going to come to me. If I wanted the reward at the end, I'd have to go after it. Follow after things which make. You ever wonder why churches don't get along with each other? They're not following after it. You know why they're not peaceful and everybody's at everybody's throat? They're not working hard at being peaceful. Now watch this very carefully. And things wherewith, see it's one, it's one thing for the minister to stand up and build you up. Hey, you look pretty good today. Everybody looks like they probably showered, dressed nice, came in here. It looks like you're all got a smile on. Everything's all right between you and your father and everything's just all hunky-dory because you're in church today. <clears throat> it's one thing for the minister to stand up and try to build you up and try to encourage you, but that's not the only one that has the responsibility. Let us, beginning of the verse, follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. You walk in and somebody's sitting in your spot. Rather than get all angry about it, you know what you ought to do? God, I am so thankful that they're in church today. I don't care where they sit. I mean, 
They could sit in my spot. They could sit in the preacher's spot. They could sit in the choir for all I care. But thank God, at least they're here. They're going to be under the sound of the Word of God, and something might be able to do. Something might be said to help them in life. They keep down a lot of fights in church, don't you think? Yes, amen. If you don't like what they're singing, get you a songbook and sing your own. After 20 some years, and I'll be honest with you, I'm getting a little tired of just general aggravation. And we no longer have to wonder why we seem like we're going backwards. We're why we're going backwards. So we need to change that. I had a guy I used to work with all the time. He used to do this whenever, whenever he tried to make a point. Uh, whenever somebody would do something dumb and keep repeating doing something dumb, he would do this. He said, this hurts. I wonder what I should do. <laughs> Folks, if we, if we were honest, let's just look around. If any church isn't what it ought to be, we cannot blame Obama. There's plenty of blame to go around the government, believe me. But we can't blame Obama for the church. We can't blame the liberals for the church. We can't blame the government for the church. We can't blame the loss for the way the church is. There's only one person to blame if the church isn't what it ought to be. Years ago when I was a boy, there's a cartoon on, in the newspaper. Some of you haven't even heard of it, but some of you remember it. It was uh, about a gator in the Okefenokee Swamp. His name was Pogo. And I remember as a kid reading a line that I remembered my whole life because it just, it, it makes sense. He said, we have met the enemy and he is us. If the church isn't what it ought to be, don't look too far for who to blame. It's us. The evangelization of sinners, the edification of saints. Over in Ephesians chapter 4, you don't have to turn over there. But it says that the ministry, the church was designed with pastors and teachers and evangelists and all that. And it says, and the reason it was put in there for that was for two reasons. For ministry and for edification. So it was designed so that when it works well, everybody's edified. And in verse 14, I just think it's kind of interesting in context. We always talk about if we're going to do something, you need to do it in context, right? Keep it in context. And so in verse 14, it says, and be no more children. Uh, more and more I study, the more I'm convinced that Paul was a Baptist. He knew what he was talking about when it came to Baptist churches. Be no more children. I'll get back to that as I close the sermon, but we'll move on. Thirdly, I want to give you this. And this is the most important thing that draws the other two together. We not only need to be involved in the evangelization of sinners and the edification of saints, but we need to be involved in the elevation of the Savior. We need to get out of the notion that we're all that important. <clears throat> you know what's going to happen to lost sinners if you lift you up? Nothing. You still got to die and go to hell. Heard a guy say one time, said, uh, you meet me and you forget me, you've not lost anything. But you meet God and you forget you met him, you've lost everything. <clears throat> Listen, I, I'm telling you, we churches, now I'm not talking about that. I, I haven't been here in 30 years except to visit. I don't know. Preacher didn't tell me. He didn't give me a list of names. And he didn't give me, oh, man, I wish you'd preach on this because you, you wouldn't believe what's going on. He didn't do that, but he didn't have to. All churches are alike. Yeah. We're made up of us. And us is sinful. Man. And us is self-determined. And us is self-conceited. Yeah. And us wants us to have everything. Yeah. I don't care what church it is. 
That's just the way it is. So here's how you avoid that. Get your mind off of you. Jesus said it I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. You know what our job is? <clears throat> John said when he heard that Jesus was on the scene. Now John was a pretty important character in history. I mean he was the uh, the one that kind of dovetailed that Old Testament law thing to this new thing, grace, which he didn't even know what it was yet, but he's on the way to making that connection. Pretty important character. I mean, Jesus Christ used him to baptize him. John's a pretty important character in the Bible, wouldn't you say? Amen. When he found out Jesus Christ showed up, he said, he must increase. Yes. Now that's great in and of itself, but it's the other part that makes that possible. He must increase, but I must decrease. There's not room for both of you on top. Paul said this in Colossians chapter one, that in all things, that in all things he might have the preeminence. There's no other place atop first place. And there's only room for one in first place. If we allowed Jesus Christ to be elevated to the place he needs to be in our churches, then the evangelization of sinners and the edification of the saints would work out a whole lot better than it's working. The gifts and calling of God, Paul said, are without repentance, or Jesus said that, and talks about uh, the gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Won't get off into that. That's a tangent. I'm actually well known in my church for digressing. I get running. See, most people call that rabbit trails. I don't call it rabbit trails. I digress, and sometimes I get back, and sometimes I don't. But I, I digress. I go off on little tangents and things. But uh, suffice it to say, you're, you're you're all pretty much familiar with First Corinthians chapter twelve. I would assume the spiritual gifts. So I'm not going to teach that this morning. I'll leave that to the preacher. But I will tell you this: they serve a purpose in the church. The gifts that you have, some of you have a gift for gab. Some of you love to talk. Unfortunately, though, you talk about a lot of stuff, doesn't matter. You ought to use that gift for gab to tell somebody else about a Savior. Some of you make friends well. I, I'm going to say something here that I said in my church, and I know people are going to misunderstand it, but I believe it's the truth. I told the folks in my church, I don't want everybody that's a member of my church necessarily to go door knocking on behalf of Bible Way Baptist Church. Now the preachers just amen me because they get it. You want some sourpuss curmudgeon got Lindberger cheese under his nose all the time and just thinks the world stinks. You want him to walk up to some stranger and knock on the door and say, I'm from Temple Baptist Church. And if you don't get saved, you're going to die and split hell wide open. Is that how you want your church represented? No, what he said was true. But that's not probably the approach that your pastor will want you to use. There's some folks, listen, there's some folks in church that just give church a bad name. That's just all there is to it. I, I told my church a while back, we ought to live our life so that we give the church a blue ribbon and not a black eye. You ever heard about preachers falling and all that kind of stuff? Every time you hear that kind of stuff, Jesus gets a black eye. You don't hear the stories about people that do the right stuff. And I know they're out there. But wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be great if this church had the reputation in the community? And he's supposed to have a good reputation in the community. 
That's what he was told in, in, in the Bible. He's supposed to have a good reputation of them with or without. <clears throat> Wouldn't it be something if Temple Baptist Church was known as the church in the community that really acted like a church is supposed to act? You've got all the tools available at your disposal. You have the Holy Spirit living inside you. You have the Word of God that's absolutely true and perfect. It gives you all the stuff. <clears throat> you have a calling. The gifts and calling are individually dispersed, but they're not for your individual benefit. Amen. They're for mutual benefit. We are called. You may not be called to the ministry. You don't be, may not be called to be a Sunday school teacher or whatever. You may not be called to be a missionary. But every one of you in here that's born again is called to be a saint. You know what that means? <clears throat> when I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, I became a saint. Right? Y'all ain't following with me. When I trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, I automatically became a saint. Thank you. So what in the world could he have meant by we're called to be saints? What in the world could he mean by that? I'm not a very deep fellow. But I believe this is what he meant. If you're a saint, you're supposed to act like a saint. You're supposed to be peculiar. You're supposed to be different from the world. What do we always say about the world? We say, well, they just act like animals. Why? Because that's how animals live. Lost people do what lost people do because they're lost. Well, I wonder what in the world saved people do what they do for them. You ever thought about that? The world looks at us and say the only thing different is they dress different and they use a little few different words, but he acts just like I do at work. What's the difference about him? Wouldn't it be something if they actually noticed? Say the disciples. They took note of them that they had been with Jesus. Wonder who, when's the last time somebody took note of you and said, wonder what's different. They sure are peculiar. Somebody said you're peculiar, some might be taking offense to it. You know, thank God somebody thinks you're a little bit on the odd side. If you're doing the right stuff for the right reason. Called to be saints. Saints are to act like saints. I'm going to leave you with this thought. About a little while ago I mentioned that <clears throat> the church was designed and set up so that it had leadership and different facets of leadership so that the ministry could be conducted properly and also that edification could come about. And it said then, in back in down in verse 14 of that, it said, quit acting like children. Be no more children. Amen. Paul said, I thought as a child, acted as a child, and I became a man. I put away childish things. Oh, listen, when I was a little younger, I loved roller coasters and all that kind of stuff. You couldn't put me on a bad enough roller coaster. I love that stuff. Now I'm older, they make them smaller. <laughs> it's not how I remember them when I was younger. And I've had several surgeries that preclude. I'm not pregnant, it may look like it, but I'm not pregnant. But I, uh, there's some reasons I can't get on. I, I miss doing that. I love getting on there and there's that, that exhilaration and the dropping in your stomach in your, I, I love that stuff. <clears throat> and I could probably force myself to do it today. <clears throat> My wife and family could visit me in the nursing home as soon as I uh, got out of the hospital and I wouldn't be able to preach anymore. I wouldn't be able to drive anymore. I wouldn't be able to do anything that I need to do. So see, there comes a time when you have to put away those childish things, no matter how enjoyable they were. He said, be no more children. I'm going to leave you with this thought. And I, I, I'm going to say this, not directing at anybody in this building, because I don't know most of you. But I do know us as Christians. 
And I kind of feel certain that what I'm about to say will apply to many folks in this room. And it's like that uh, old saying, if you take a rock and throw it down a dark alley, it's the dog that yelps is the one that got hit. This would not be a good time for you to bow your head when I get through making this statement because everybody knows it's you. But I have, a, I have a sneaking hunch that there's more than one person in here that will understand what I'm about to say. I pastored churches for, or pastored a church for over 20 years. Not everybody has acted like, like an adult when conflict comes. They don't act like adults. When pressures and problems come, they don't act like adults. They just act like little children that somebody just took their last marble away. And uh, they're going to make sure that everybody hears them scream loud and hard about how they were treated. That's how a child acts. That's not how an adult acts. So I'm going to give you just a little piece of advice that I've learned. And I've been saved over 40 years. <clears throat> been in and around the ministry for over 30. Been pastoring for over 20. I've learned a couple of things. I'll give you a piece of advice. If you insist on acting like a child, and some of you will, if you insist on acting like a child, make sure you're acting like a child of God. Lord, we do thank you for the opportunity we've had today. God, I thank you for this book. I thank you for the Savior that we've attempted to elevate this morning.